humbly, Lord. And we ask that you would come and you would purify our hearts, Lord, that you would come and clean our hands, that you would come and wash us once again with the blood of Jesus that you poured out all those years ago on the hill of Calvary, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, that we could be made clean, that we could be made white as snow, Lord, that you came and you forgave us of all our sins, Lord. And that not only did you save us, but you're continually saving us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would come and continue to regenerate our hearts and regenerate our minds, Lord. Lord, we come before you humbly, and we're here to worship you with praise and thanksgiving and with gladness and with joy, Lord. And we submit ourselves to you this morning, God. Lord, you are welcome in this place. This is your house. We are your children. Lord, come. Lord, come. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Keep us down and join us this morning.
every fear I lay at your feet. Yes, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. belongs to you. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. Yes, God, we humble ourselves before you this morning. Lord, we know that the battle is yours, that you've already won the victory. All those years ago on that cross, Lord, when Jesus, when you laid down your life, Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. Our salvation, our friend, our healer, our conqueror, our king. We worship you in this place this morning, Lord, and we declare you are our king, you are our God, and we give you praise. We give you praise, Lord. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light until from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father praise the father praise the son Praise the Spirit, the three in one, and God of glory, majesty, and praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal, to reveal the kingdom coming, and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died and praise the Father praise the Son praise the Spirit conquered death and the dead was from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who had come to the Father of restored and the church of Christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of all shall not kneel shall not fade by his blood and in his name his freedom I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit.
forever to the King of kings. And praise forever to the King of kings. God, we praise you in this place this morning. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great King forever. All majesty, all honor belongs to you, our God. We worship you in this place, Lord. We worship you in this place, Lord. Lord, I long to bring an offering But I don't know where to start And all I have is on the table I won't hold back a single part Sometimes I can't find the language Sometimes I'm at a loss for words And I just want to give you something yes, I do. To let you know that you're still first Oh, I, I worship you For the man who sees I felt the shadow and the sun well, Through the feast and through the famine This is my song and everyone Oh, I You're the one. 
wonderful, just how beautiful, glorious you are, matchless in every way, wonderful, beautiful, glorious, matchless in every way. ourselves before our King, and we cry out to you this morning, Lord, our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. We give you glory and honor in this place this morning. We lift your name on high. We bow our hearts before you, Lord. You are our King, our Lord, our God, our friend, our Savior, who is like you, the Lord, the Lord who was who is and is to come. Hear our children cry before you this morning. Hear us cry out, holy, holy, holy. We worship you in this place this morning. We worship you. Lord, you are beautiful, glorious, matchless in every way you are. Wonderful, Lord, you are beautiful, glorious, matchless in every way. Wonderful, beautiful, glorious, matchless in every way. Let's turn this morning to Luke chapter 12, verse 13. We'll prepare to take the, the offerings and the tithes. Just a reminder, if you want to give, uh, there's a basket over here. Uh, if you're online, you can give at DesertCreekFellowship.com. The right-hand corner of the homepage, there's lots and lots and lots of ways to give. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. This entire passage of Scripture is entitled The Parable of the Rich Fool. And it actually doesn't begin with a parable. It begins with a man asking Jesus for justice. In verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, that's Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me to be a judge or an arbiter between you? And then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. 
always been interesting to me that even back then, everybody wanted to be sure they was getting their fair share. I want to be sure I'm getting a fair shake. I want to be sure I'm not being cheated here. And so they come to Jesus because, you know, Jesus is kind of pretty well known and he got to throw a little authority to this. What Jesus said, you know, you ever been in an argument on the playground? Teacher said, you ever want to know who's in charge? Whoever said. Mom said, well, that was the plan. Come to Jesus and get Jesus to say. But instead of speaking to the man's brother about doing what's right, Jesus infers that your focus is in the entire wrong place. You're looking at this whole thing wrong. In fact, you're fighting for something you don't even get to keep. You're fighting for something that if you get it now, you're going to have to leave it here later. Why not rather fight for something that actually matters? In verse 16, and he told him this parable. Ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, ah, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And say to myself, self, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And then in verse 21, Jesus will bring out the point of the parable. He says this, This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. As I hang out with people and we talk, I I think people find me to be a bit of an enigma maybe, you know. I tell people to be wise about the future, right? You should probably prepare a little bit for the times that are ahead. And I also tell people there's little gain in storing things up. They're like, dude, which is it? Pick one. Well, look, like most things in life, it's both. There's truth in both. Yes, I... I do store up provision for later. But I never put my hope in that which I have prepared. I don't put my hope in the strength of my mighty right hand. Because that wouldn't be very smart. So what I do is I try to operate in wisdom without getting tangled up in greed. Jesus' final statement in this passage is so revealing, and I I love the way he approaches it. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Maybe, Maybe that's to say a man who has no inheritance with God. He's never bothered to lay up any riches in heaven. All of his affections are fixed here in this place, fixed on earth, in this world. He's made no provision in that place. He's he's not been rich toward God, and that, friends, is a mistake. There's a a lot of takeaways from this parable. I want to share this morning with you just a couple, uh, in fact, just a very few couple. First off, It's really easy to look at somebody's life, look at their outward prosperity, and say, that guy's got it all together. And yet, I would remind you of what the Bible says. Even though God gives a man the desires of his heart, it often comes with a leanness of soul. You'll find that in Psalm 106, verses 14 through 15. Sometimes we push God so hard because we want something. The the passage in Psalm is referring to when the children of Israel insisted that they have meat to eat. They were tired of the manna. And God finally said, great, I will just give you what you want. Sometimes it comes with a leanness of soul. Second, it is true, money does have a way of answering all things. 
You'll find that in Ecclesiastes 10, 19. But riches also come with an increased load of cares and anxieties. Just an offshoot. Third, while riches can solve a lot of problems, they simply cannot keep their owners from the grave. Death will at some point visit all men. All men. And wealth has no way of alleviating that time. It can't prevent it. Maybe prolong it, but can't prevent it. Fourth, the man who trusts in his own riches, the man who is making his own way. This is what scares me when people start to store up. They've got, I got this thing figured out. This is what we need to do. Pretty soon he's going to realize that he has been a fool in the sight of God. And as things unfold, he will find in his own eyes he's been a fool as well. Fifth, the path to true, true wisdom is to seek first the kingdom of God. See, when, when the time comes, the Lord said to the, the rich landowner, <laughs> you fool. You were foolish. Doesn't matter how much or how little your portion here was. This is such a meager amount of time in comparison with eternity. You should probably shift your focus to something that matters. Sixth, there's a great danger when your affections become fixed on your riches. When people store up things for themselves, they begin to take security in them, and their focus goes toward them. We start to think, that is my Savior. It's not your Savior. It never will be your Savior. So, use the things of this world, but don't fall in love with them. Consider Lot's wife. I don't know what kind of nice china that girl had that she had to turn around and, and look for. I mean, there was something that held her back. And I heard a guy once say, and I, listen, it's, it's very esoteric. I'm not trying to build theologies here. He said, as, as that last generation is caught up to heaven, I wonder how many will look back and go, I wonder, if, I wonder who's going to get my car. I wonder what's going to happen to my house. Oh, look, I don't know, but I got to tell you, I'm going to be looking up, not back. Because I didn't leave anything here. Friends, as we, as we move into the times that lie ahead, there's wisdom in making preparations. But don't put your hope in what you prepare. There's no gain in that. Put your hope in Him. And, and if you can, do. If you can't, it's okay, because God will make a way for you. And those of you who are preparing, please keep in mind you're probably preparing for somebody else. I, I think we forget that. Sometimes people are storing up a lot. It's like, oh, you'll never use all that. Have you considered maybe it's for somebody else? No, they won't get that. Uh-oh. All right, enough said. I just want you to understand. Seek first the kingdom of God. All these other things, they'll be added to you. Father, I bless your people today in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for them. I thank you, Father, for your goodness to them. Father, I pray today that you would bring a richness and a fullness to their soul. I pray, Father, that you would make a way for them. I pray, Father, that you would forgive debts. Our only real debt is to you. I pray, Father, that you would remove debt from this house wherever it exists, and that you would remove lack from this house wherever it exists, and that you would bring the blessing. I pray, Father, that this house would be marked by the prosperity of the Lord, and not so we can have a new boat, but, Father, so we can sow into the nations. In Jesus' name, amen. Along those lines, I, I'm not sure what God's doing, um, but I really feel like I'm going to be going to India and Nepal later this fall.
we'll see what the Lord does. I don't know for sure, but um, uh, you met Pastor Simon last week, and in a couple weeks you'll uh, get a chance to hear from Pastor Daniel again. And they both have been pushing me to go for some time. And I feel like I feel like the Lord's opening the door. So praise the Lord. You could be praying for me about that. All right, buckle up. Here we go. Let's turn this morning to Luke chapter 22. I'm going to begin in verse 39. This portion of scripture happens right after the Last Supper. So Judas has gone to get the the jailers and, and all the people involved because he's going to testify against Jesus. And so Jesus is now down from 12 to 11 and uh, they're going to go to uh, the Mount of Olives. This is what Jesus would do in the evening. This is going to be Jesus' last night on earth. In verse 39, and Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like Drops of blood falling to the ground. Let's pray. Lord, help me today to share your word with your people. Help me today, Father, to encourage them and to strengthen them. Help me, Lord, to be who you've called me to be in this hour and for this hour. Help me, Father, to be the leader you've called me to be. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is Jesus' last night. Now, if you were, you don't need to turn there. In chapter 4 of Hebrews, the writer is going to speak about Jesus becoming the high priest of a new covenant. And he says that he is a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weakness because he was tempted in every way just as we are. Yet, he was without sin. I from time to time, come back to this particular night in the garden with Jesus because it offers a great insight into the realm of spiritual things. I think it, it, it grounds us and helps us to understand. The Bible says that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives as usual. If you spent any time studying the scripture, you would know that this was his way during the last week of his life. So he makes the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And during the last week of his life, his custom would be to spend his day in the temple area teaching the people. And then in the late afternoon, the evening, he would retire to the Mount of Olives with his disciples and he would work with them because like time's short. And so he would help encourage them and strengthen them, prepare them for what was about to come. So days in the temple preaching, evenings with his disciples. Now, if you were to read this account out of one of the other Gospels, it'll say uh, that on this particular night, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. I want you to know that that's not a typo. It's not a mistake. The Garden of Gethsemane is a garden that rested at the base of the Mount of Olives. It's a relatively large garden. Uh, and Gethsemane means uh, wine press, or uh, not wine press, olive press. So you've got the Mount of Olives where all these wonderful olive trees are, and then this garden at the bottom. Uh, some of these other accounts will add a little bit more detail to the picture. You'll remember that when Jesus arrived at the garden, he withdrew about a stone's throw from his disciples. If you Uh, read in Luke's gospel, uh, that's where we get the stone's throw away. Matthew and Mark tell us that as he withdraws the stone's throw away, 
He takes with him three. Didn't take the whole crew with him. It's interesting to me. Peter, James, and John. And so he will go with them. Friends, I, just a sidebar. When you enter that time of your life, when you're under great duress, when you're under great pressure, it matters who you take with you. It does. They were all good men. But he didn't take them all. He took, took three. And we could argue that that was even kind of a sketchy choice because they all fell asleep. But the point is he took, he chose who he took with him in that time. And so he brought them out and then he withdrew yet further, a little bit further away from them. And he begins to pray and he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Jesus understood what was about to happen to him in the morning. This was not a surprise. He, he knew all of the things that were about to come. He was a prophet, and he knew why he'd been born. He knew what would come at the rising of the sun. And he also knew this. He knew he possessed in his own hand the power to change it. He could call on the angels, and they would fight for him. But the truth is, friends, he didn't come to be saved from that hour. He came to fulfill it. He came to embrace it. And now, now there is this peace, this thing within him. Father, if this cup can pass, but see, so clearly does he understand what's about to happen. This is what brings this prayer about. He is very clear about what's happened. The Bible says his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Matthew 26, 38. An angel will come and strengthen him, attend to him. But even with that, Heavenly help. The Bible says, being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. He was completely overwhelmed. Such an overwhelming that blood vessels begin to break, mingling with sweat. This, friends, is great distress. We've been, I've, been, I've never been this distressed. But listen to his prayer. See, his prayer wasn't simply, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. That's usually where we stop. Father, if you just take this, fix this mess. But not him. He continues. He says, but not my will. Yours be done. You can't, you can't pray a prayer like that without understanding a few things about the nature of God's kingdom. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, and just a few days earlier, he was working with his disciples, and he was sharing with them some things one evening about what was going to happen. Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. He was telling them about what's, this is what's going to take place. And, and they had a lot of questions, um, because he'd kind of let tip some of the things that are coming. The temple's going to be destroyed, some other things. And they're like, mm, you, we need more info on that, because I want to know how that affects me. What does that mean for me? I want to know what's going to happen, but I want to know what's going to happen to me. And in Matthew 24, 37, a couple days earlier, Jesus tells him quite clearly, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. I think that's worth noting. I think it's worth taking a minute to see just what it was like in the days of Noah. Because Jesus seemed to think it was important. Certainly the world had gotten a little sketchy. Things had gone pretty far sideways. I look at the world today and think, oh man, this, this isn't going to end well. Sometimes I'll be walking the house going, this isn't going to end well. I, I mean, yikes. I look at the stuff and I just, I got no words. Well, it was worse then. 
In Genesis 6, 6, we read that it was so bad God regretted that he had made human beings in the earth. Wow. What must it have been like then? It says he was grieved in his heart. So, yeah, I guess it was getting pretty bad. And yet God, God was going to rescue mankind through a man named Noah. So he puts his plan together, and you know how the story ends. Can I just ask you, though, when God chooses to rescue Noah and his three sons, did he do it by taking Noah out of the trouble, or did he do it by taking Noah through the trouble? Darn it. Through. Okay, I told you there's a nature of our father. This is the nature of our Father. He tends to take us through the troubled waters. Consider the children of Israel. They find themselves in a relatively sticky situation. The Red Free Sea is before them, and the army of Egypt is closing in behind them, and mountains on either side. It's like, uh oh, this isn't going to end well. Surely God. These are his chosen people. Surely he will take them out. Um, No. What did he do? Took them through. I mean, literally took them through. He parted the Red Sea and they walked through on dry ground. Didn't take them out. What about the three Hebrew boys? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Out or through? Through, yeah, through. And so this night as Jesus is praying in the garden, I just can't help what he thinks going through his mind. You suppose he's prayerfully expecting God to take him out? No. No. See, he knows the trouble that the morning's going to bring. He knows. He knows the pain, he knows the sorrow, he knows the struggles, he knows all the stuff. But he also knows this, his God will take him through. He knows God will take him through. He's not worried that God won't bring him through. Truth is, guys, if you spend any time searching the scriptures, you're going to find yourself fairly hard-pressed to find a scenario where God takes people out instead of through. It's just not his way. Even his own son. Even his own son. My child, I'm taking him out. I'll make him go through. You would do the same for your kids. And yet, God has purpose in through rather than out. And it makes me wonder why we, as the ecclesia in the earth today, and I think that term gets thrown around a lot. I hope you know what I mean by that. When I talk about the ecclesia, I'm talking about the governing body of Christ in the earth today. There there are those who stand in Jesus' name, those who are found in Christ, those who take a stand and see the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Now. In the days of Jesus, after he ascended, it was his disciples, the apostles, that became the ecclesia in that day. They were the governing body. It seems odd to me. Some people believe that that all passed away with them. Why would God not leave a governing body on the earth today? It doesn't seem reasonable to me. And friends, you and I, we are that ecclesia. We are the governing body. We are the ones who, who take a stand in the earth. We are the called out ones. We're the, those who are chosen. We are those who occupy until Christ returns to claim what's his. So can I ask you then, why, why is the ecclesia in the earth today, the called out ones, why are they so surprised 
when God takes us through the troubled waters rather than taking us out of them. I don't get that. Why is the possessors of the promises, the covenant bearers, why are we looking for God to take us out? I think we should be looking for God to take us through. Oh, now, Pastor, we're not looking for that. Oh, yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. And I'm not being mean. I'm just, what I'm trying to do is bring to light truth that is there that sometimes we draw back from. Even the tiniest of troubles seem to overwhelm us. And yet we, none of us, have resisted to the point of shedding our own blood. He hasn't even been turned up yet. And a lot of people are looking for the exit. No? I, look, I'm not picking on anybody. I smile. I hope you know that's a smile of love. I'm not mad at anybody. I just get such a kick out of this whole pre-trib rapture movement, I don't know what to do. Now, if you're not familiar with it, it's a theology that says God is going to take his church out and rescue them before anything bad happens in the earth. So if you read the book of Revelation, there's some pretty heady stuff in there. There's some pretty not, not fun sounding stuff. It sort of gets bad in the book. If you read through, things get pretty bad. And so the theology has come that God's going to take us out before it gets bad. And look, if that's an option, sign me up. Right? I joke with Pastor Mark a lot. He says, you believe whatever you want. I'm out on the first load. Look, if there's a first load, I'm going to be out on it too. See, what I'm saying is, is if the cup can pass for me, awesome. Sign me up. But here's the rest. If it can't, if God's plan is to take me through rather than out, I want you to know I'm okay with that too. See, the question that you have to ask yourself, I can't answer it for you. Can you? We can all say the first half of Jesus' prayer. Father, if it's your will, let the cup pass. But can you finish the prayer? Nonetheless. Yet. Not my will, Lord, but yours be. One of the reasons that pre-trib rapture troubles me. Look, there's no answers. There's no definitive answers about these things. This one troubles me because it sets a false expectation for the entire body of Christ. Friends, even your master, Christ himself, was not excused from the trial. Yet in your mind, you think it's reasonable to think you will be. I think that sets false expectations. It's one of the most popular end time theologies. And can I ask why? Is it because it is the most scripturally sound? Or is it because that's the one we're all secretly hoping for? Yeah, well, let me give you a hint. It's not because it's the most scripturally sound. What I'm trying to teach you today, what I want you to grasp, is when you pray, you must learn the unspoken motives of your heart. There are things in there you are not aware of. There are things in there that you secretly want. And when you come to prayer, what you try to do is take what you secretly want, find out how that kind of fits with something maybe God wants, and how you can make a win-win out of the whole deal. So you figure out what God wants, knowing what you want, and then you start praying that way. What if God were to reveal to you the motives of your heart? What if he were to pull back the curtain and show you what was in there? Show you your real desires. When we pray for our nation, what are our desires? I think you need to be real careful. 
What is it you want in the end? Is it you want people saved? Or is it you don't want to go through troubles? Let me back up just a bit. Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Last week we celebrated. What was the great miracle of Pentecost? A great miracle. Was it the violent wind that came through the house? Was it the tongues of fire that rested on the disciples? Was it a Holy Spirit prompting to speak in new tongues? Was it, was it people from all religion, from all the area, all the nations, hearing the wonders of God in their own language? Was it the prophetic utterance of Peter? Or was it this? On that day, 3,000 people were saved from the fire of hell. There's your miracle. That's the miracle. And so when you pray for the country, what are your goals? Look, let's just be honest. Most of you know how the book ends. Yeah. Read through Revelation. It's quite clear. It ends with a one world government. It ends with a common currency. One means of payment. It ends with a common religion. And quick hint, it isn't Christianity. And it ends with this. God's elect being tested and tried. Friends, this is an end that is as certain as the sun coming up tomorrow. This is how it's going to end. It is how it's going to happen. It is certain it will happen exactly this way. And so, when you pray for our nation, what are your goals? What are your motives? Are you praying for America because you genuinely believe that America plays a key role, an important role, in the advancement of the gospel in the nations? That is, is the end game of your prayer, the salvation of souls, when you're praying for our nation to be restored? Or are you praying because you don't want to face an outcome that is pretty clearly laid out? Hoping somehow maybe uh, you can manage to kick the can down the road until uh, it's somebody else's problem. Maybe... Maybe someone who's a little stronger in their faith. Maybe someone who's a little more committed in their faith. Maybe maybe somebody like Paul. Okay, today's message isn't about praying for America. It's not, it's not about pre, mid, or post-trib rapture. It's about the motives of your heart when you pray. It's about recognizing that God's nature is to take you through the storm. Not out of it. It's always been his nature. And when you find yourself in the midst of whatever you're struggling with today and you're looking for the escape hatch, you know what I'm talking about. It's gotten so bad. Just jettison the whole thing. Start over. Okay, friends, you're experiencing fear, not faith. And, and, and it's not a bad thing. Just recognize it for what it is. It's fear. I know many of you are going through some trying times. This is why I've said it before. I'll say it again. Because it bears repeating. The only way for you to lose is to quit. It's the only way. It's the only way you can lose. Just walk off the field. And this is what makes Jesus' prayer that night so powerful and so wonderful. Father, if this cup can pass with the, with the complete and full understanding that if it passes, it will allow the fullness of your will to be completed. If that's possible, then let it pass. But if it can't, if there's no way for this cup to pass and still fulfill your will, then I'm all in. You know, I, I spend time with Pastor Simon and Pastor Daniel and some of the other pastors around the world. <laughs> I just can't help but realize just how 
just how soft we are. We're like old marshmallows. Pick up Pastor Pastor Simon at the airport. He come, he's coming out of the doors. He's got his little 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 bag, right? That's that's this guy's Bible. It's like, oh, um, where's your luggage? No luggage, brother. Just brought my Bible and my book. Four days. My goodness, I thought I traveled light. And you might think, well, that's just not possible. Well, clearly it is. What did Jesus tell the disciples when he sent them out? Don't take another shirt with you. No, I'm, I mean, like, when you go, don't pack any clothes. Don't take a bag. Don't take any money. He actually lives that stuff. Marshmallows. We're marshmallows. We're soft. See, here's the thing. I'm willing to pay whatever price is necessary to advance the gospel of God as long as it doesn't cost me anything. Wait a minute. You're willing to pay any price that doesn't cost you anything? That's usually how we approach things. I'm willing to pay. I just don't want to have to come up with any money. I'm willing to pay. I just don't want to have to spend time in prayer. Just a reminder, friends. You take a minute and you look back at your life. I borrowed this this week's email from Footprints in the Sand. Sometimes it's good to look back at your life. See the struggles you faced? See the victories that you've won? Can I remind you that those are the training ground of the Christian? We're going through just these terrible things in our lives. Okay, I'm being a little dramatic. They're not terrible like some of the other people deal with. You're not being persecuted to the point of death. You're not being hauled into jail because you prayed in a prayer meeting. But these are the training ground of the Christian. It is in these struggles that you will learn how to, how to trust God. You'll learn how to lean on Him. You'll learn how to walk in His promises. You learn how to handle the shield and wield the sword. Friends, you don't need him to take you out of the storm. You need to learn to let him take you through. And as I talk with Christians, it's like, dude, I, I don't know who told you that. Somewhere along the line, we started telling people that when you become a Christian, all your problems go away. I... Man, I'm sorry, but that's just that's just not true. And I've looked, I can't find a promise to back it up. See, there was never a promise that you would be taken out of the storm. If, if there is, I can't find it. And I would be greatly interested in knowing about it if there is one. The promise that I can find is that he will take you through. He will protect you in the midst of the storm. He will complete in you the good work that he began in you the day you made your surrender to him. That guy's life is full of crazy, crazy storms. Sunless days, starless nights. You never know how God's going to take you through. But we have a promise that he will. Sometimes in the midst of a storm, I know I feel like this. Maybe you feel this way too. We start to feel like I need a fresh word from God. You know what I've learned over the years? In most cases, you don't need a fresh word. You don't need a new word. What you need is the same word. You need to hear the same promise again. Only this time you need to hear it with fresh ears. And see it with fresh eyes. You need to hear it new from the Holy Spirit. And then you need to believe it, regardless of how impossible it looks. I trust him. I have no idea how he's going to pull this one off. And then what happens is hope is born and hope will give birth to faith. And then you can lay hold of the promise. Yikes. I close with Deuteronomy chapter 1. I put this in the newsletter too, because I like it. Deuteronomy 1, 29 through 33. This is Moses 
speaking to the people. And Deuteronomy, you might recall, is a book of remembrance. He's reminding the people of what happened that day they sent the spies out. And they saw the land that God had given them. Nobody said there was going to be giants. How did that escape your... I mean, you told us a milk, honey, you got all that. You didn't mention the giants. No, because if he had, you probably wouldn't have went. Verse 29, so I said to you, this is Moses speaking, so I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. That's the giants in the land. The Lord your God who goes before you will fight for you just as you saw him do for you in Egypt. And in the wilderness, where the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son. All the way by which you have traveled until you reach this place. Sort of in general, he's saying, he picked you up there and he's carried you the whole way. But in spite of all this, you did not trust the Lord your God, who went before you on the journey, in the fire by night, in the cloud by day. Seek out a place for you to camp and to show you the road to travel. Guys, I just want to remind you, don't be afraid. Look, I don't know what comes, but it don't matter. Don't be afraid. His nature is to take us through, not to take us out. So buck up, lay hold of the promises, and let's let God lead the way. Father, I bless your people today, and I'm so thankful for them. Father, thank you for faith rising in this congregation. Father, thank you for life rising in us. Father, thank you for people that are not of those who draw back, but people of those who push forward. Father, we're not looking for our escape. We're looking for your victory. Help us, Lord, through the, the times that we walk through, the times when we find our faith has grown weak and we have forgotten the promise you've made. Father, thank you for sending ministering angels to us. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that lives within us, the paraclete that reminds us of all the things that Jesus said and shows us what is yet to come. Father, thank you for equipping us for this very hour, putting us in this place, calling us to be those who will occupy in this time. And in this season, for such a time as this, help us, Lord, to take our stand boldly and righteously. Father, I bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother, you want to come? We will. Uh, I really like communion, so we're going to take communion every day. I like communion. Uh, the way we do it here, if you're not familiar, communion is up front. As the band plays the song, just come up and grab the elements, bring them back to your chair, and then we will take them together. Also, I would remind you that communion is not something to be taken lightly. Communion is for believers. It is a sign of a covenant that you've made with him. If you haven't made the covenant, then probably you shouldn't be wearing a ring. That's all I'm saying. The Bible says that we should examine our hearts before we receive communion, and I would encourage you to do that as well. On the night our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which shall be broken for you. Do this in memory of me. And when the supper had ended, he took the cup. And again he gave thanks and gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink it. This is my blood, which will be shed for you, so that your sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Father God, we just thank you for your grace and mercy. And we know that it is sufficient. Help us to, in the midst of trying times, to not forget that. 
remember that and just stand on it. Know that you're there with us, and you will carry us through. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. As you consider the end of time, the book of Revelation comes together. I wonder how you see the church, your picture of the church. I think for some people, the way they see the church is a group of people living in caves, eating MREs. You laugh, but yeah, everybody's awful busy storing up provisions for all this stuff. That's not how I see the church. I see the church victorious. I see the church overcoming. I see the church leading, taking a stand in righteousness and truth and in holiness. I see a church that is not ashamed. I don't know how you can be hiding in caves and not somehow be ashamed. But, either way. So I want to encourage you, friends. He will take you through. Don't, don't be upset about your time in the battle. This is where you learn how to use the weapons. Oh, I hate when it comes. Yeah, but you're going you're gonna to become lethal with the weapons. Don't be afraid. Father, I bless your people now in Jesus' name. Father, I call them the head and not the tail. Father, I speak your life over them. I speak, Father, your wisdom over them. I pray, Father, you would lead them and guide them into all truth. I pray, Father, that you would make their mouths a gospel horn. I pray, Father, the signs and the wonders spoken of about true believers would follow them and that they wouldn't have to chase them. I pray, Father, that you would move on their hearts and minds and speak truth to them, reveal your life to them, Jesus. 